I would like to welcome the community forum viewers to this show on the revitalization of the downtown and the uh, updates from the planning board of the town of Stoughton. Um, I'm Joe Scardino, I'm chairman of the planning board in the town of Stoughton, and I'm pleased to have with me today at my far left, Kathleen McCabe of McCabe Enterprises. Um, Kathleen was the economic development specialist that assisted us during the uh, process under the master plan for focusing in on revitalization of the downtown. Um, to my immediate left uh, is Noreen O'Toole, the town planner, who assisted the planning board uh, in the master plan project. And uh, we'll be talking with you today about an, uh, updating, and updating you as well about projects in the square, um, the master plan, discussion of the um, revitalization program that the, uh, was developed by the committee, and uh, some updates as to where we are with that uh, plan as of uh, uh, recent uh, uh, events. Um, again, I'm pleased to have with me Kathleen McCabe of McCabe Enterprises. And uh, I just to set the tone, uh, Kathleen, I, I'm going to bring us back to the um, the work that we that was done. Uh, this is the uh, uh, portfolio that was uh, the analysis that was done specifically on the downtown area, and that was a result of the efforts of thousands of of, of people participating in the um, process of the master plan, and out of that came um, the vision that um, the townspeople. Um, focused on and expressed that the town center is the number one priority for improvement as identified in the master planning process. Residents wish for a more positive image of the downtown and therefore Stoughton overall. They look to the square as the social and cultural center and heart of the Stoughton community. Downtown is considered to be an important focus for economic development. And it was pretty much unanimous that, that um, People participating in the visioning process felt that the downtown needed the attention, the focus, uh, and the primary efforts of all of the town boards, commissions, and bodies. And um, that's why we engaged an expert um, in the area of economic development and community development, Ms. McCabe, um, who went through a very thorough analysis of the existing conditions in the downtown. And I guess I'd like to start off by asking her um, what, um, what are the steps that uh, any planner looking to revitalize a downtown um, should take and uh, what are the best practices? Well, thanks, Joe. And it's great to be back in Stoughton talking about downtown and I've seen some ch uh, changes on uh, improvements since when we first did the work on the master plan when got a lot of community input in terms of best practices uh, one of the uh, premier models for downtown revitalization is really the Main Street approach this was uh, really developed by the National Trust for Historic Preservation it has worked throughout the country uh, and has been very successful and it uh, involves both a self-help as well as um, professional, you know, professional staff working with neighbors, residents, property owners, and business uh, the business community. Uh, so I often find the Main Street approach is very effective for uh, towns like Stoughton. Uh, it's been used uh, in Massachusetts successfully. Uh, Dedham has recently used the Main Street approach in terms of how it's approached revitalization of De Dedham Square. Norwood used it. Um, Roslindale did it. There's many examples of successful use of the Main Street approach uh, throughout the area. And it really involves four points uh, involving organization. That's a public-private partnership involving townspeople, involving uh, 
nonprofits, local businesses, property owners, as well as local government. Um, looking at pro the second point is promotion. That it's important to market and promote uh, and um, make people aware of the downtown. And there's all different types of promotion, but enhancing the image as well as helping make those cash registers sing in downtown Stoughton. Design is the third point. Um, people in the vision statement talked about the image and wanting aesthetics and wanting something that was good looking and having high quality design. That doesn't mean it's uh, flashy price tags, but it does mean something that is of uh, durable and high quality that can stand the test of time. And the fourth point is really looking at economic restructuring and vitality. And that is really, you know, what might have worked 35 years ago may not be working today. We have online shopping, we have mobile payments, we've got to be contemporary and think about how t the downtown can respond to today's marketplace and s serve today's residents. So we need to look at all four points. Um, there's also eight principles that, the, um, and this might sound like a lot, but it's looking at downtown, you have to be comprehensive. That's why it's a public-private partnership that might involve a lot of town boards as well as residents. And um, so it's not, there's not one silver bullet or singular focus. It's a holistic approach. It's also incremental. Rome was not built in a day. So that you, it's a series of small projects as well as large projects. And you, you, it's that combination that really brings vitality. You want to activate and bring people to downtown Stone, have things happening, as well as do redevelopment projects. So you need a mix of both. So it's incremental. It's a series of small steps. It's kind of the Carl Ripken theory of base hits. Uh, so, uh, and it also relies on self-help. Some places say, well, the government's going to help us, or we, we need a you know, major uh, property owner, or we need this one thing. It's really that self-help, it's volunteers, it's people spending some time. You also need professional help, but it's that combination that we're all helping ourselves. Um, partnerships is uh, another point. It doesn't happen by yourself. We've got to partner with other nonprofits, partner with the business community, um, and partner with state government, as well as local government. So partnerships are critical. Um, Stoughton has a lot of assets, and a lot of times people we f forget that we have assets because we look at what's wrong instead of looking at the strengths. You know, one of the big strengths of downtown Stoughton is you've got a library. And the library is being re renovated and it's close to completion. So that's a huge asset. You have a, a very handsome town hall that was um, renovated with a preservation approach with a green around it. That's a big asset. You have the train station and the train stop. That's a huge asset. I know sometimes it's a headache, but having the train in downtown Stone. Um, a lot of communities would really, you know, uh, are envious of having a train in the center of their community. And Stoughton has one historically, and you have a handsome historic uh, train, train depot. You also have a lot of little small businesses. Some of them need a little more TLC, but you've got, you've got businesses, you've got new housing development. Um, so there's a lot of good things that are going on for, for Stoughton. Um, so you build on the assets you have. Uh, quality, as I mentioned, is always striving, you know, you strive to compete on the basis of having a high quality environment, high quality stores, and providing quality goods in, uh, in a quality environment. And change is going to happen. Uh, sometimes people are skeptical, but you make changes and you try and make visible changes so people can become believers. And implementation is critical. You need tangible results. And I know from when we first did the master plan that I can see tangible changes in downtown Stone. So I think you're on the way. Uh, yes, there's more work to do, but um, 
you know, that focus on implementation has started and um, I hope it continues. I'm just going to uh, go back to one of the points you raised because um, there's been a lot of discussion about singular projects in the square and I think everybody has their pet project that they look at, look at and say, uh, well, if we only had this online, the downtown would immediately spring into a, um, a bustling center of the town. And I think one of the points that you made was that uh, uh, your experience indicates that, that uh, there's no one big project, that there's a lot of little sparks. Did I understand that uh, correctly? You did, but I want to say projects are also important. But uh, you know, for projects to succeed, you need a lot of sparks. <laughs> so um, having the smaller incremental um, projects and, um, and events, whether it's um, bringing back the farmer's market to downtown, which is uh, really could activate downtown and it's not a big high cost thing to do. Um, and doing special events like promotions and marketing, that helps set the stage because it interests the private sector. It builds a track record of um, people coming to uh, downtown and spending time downtown. So that makes it easier to undertake bigger projects. And it's great that people have pet projects because projects need friends, allies, and advocates. You know, I think there's a couple major projects in downtown that um, are worthy of support. Obviously, revitalization of the historic train station and depot has been a, a long time goal. Uh, and that's not, a, you know, that requires a partnership with the MBTA as well as the town. And that's, that's not an easy project because Mass Historic is involved and it's, um, um, but there's, you know, there's been some progress made and um, I, I believe the town's getting some Mass Works money to help make some, you know, minor repairs and improvements. So that's a step in the right direction. So that's one project. You know, one of the things we identified uh, was uh, looking at the state theater. That's an asset, um, and that's a big project, and that's going to require, you know, significant support and investment. Um, looking at some of the other things we talked about is really, um, we identified eight steps in to total, uh, and those projects are part of those eight steps. Uh, the eight steps was to have a station focus, looking at the train station, but also looking at transit-oriented development and managing parking and looking at redevelopment right near the train station. A second uh, point was looking at greening downtown. And you already have some street trees, but extending the amount of street trees and benches and places to sit. So it's, uh, downtown's more of a walkable and attractive area. There's some opportunities to green uh, downtown at the, on the east side of Washington at Washington and Freeman on town-owned land that would continue the green strip that's in front of the historical society and the mm -hmm. church. So that, that's another place where you could add some. Uh, why, we also looked at some of the smaller side streets which already have existing businesses like Wyman Street and Porter Street. And sometimes we think about the whole downtown, but sometimes it's helpful to break it down into steps. So recruiting a few more businesses uh, for Wyman Street, you already have a bakery, you already have some services on Wyman Street. It's a very walkable street. It leads to the train station. So, you know, kind of reinforcing that and filling it out, um, maybe adding some street trees and some banners to say, okay, we're going to focus on Wyman Street and, you know, maybe some signage and facade improvements. Um, we, you know, similarly on Porter Street, you've got the House of Brews that's kind mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, helps activate that street. You've got the po um, post office, you know, filling in some of the other pieces. Uh, obviously, we called for infill development, and I see a lot of that already happening, but kind of moving forward on some of the vacancies and 
uh, underperforming sites and uh, redeveloping that. Um, the sixth point was Railroad Street uh, and South, and that really includes the State Street Theater. We really thought that that could be an arts and entertainment street, really capitalizing on the State Street Theater, and you've got a restaurant with avocados on the lower level now, so that's progress. Uh, and then the seventh point was Washington Street, and I know we've people have thought about Washington Street for a long time, but we think looking at the side streets, are that's where people really spend their time walking, and when those become more successful, Washington Street will take off. Um, and then strengthening the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, there's a lot of housing uh, in and around uh, that's um, downtown, and some of that could uh, benefit from some housing rehab and home repair, which I understand the town recently got some community development block grant to start working on. So I think there's a lot of things going on that you're poised for success. You've got, you know, you've put, um, you put things in motion. If I could just add something to that, um, when you were talking uh, Wyman Street and the other station, uh, actually, the town did get a, um, a DACD grant for a sign-in facade program. Oh, great. That is just, um, just, you know, coming, you know, to fruition probably within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'll be working with the economic development coordinator, um, and we've developed, like, some design criteria, too. And right now, um, the... Um, Pam McCarthy, who's the coordinator, she uh, has four people that in mind that will be coming in and filling out the applications. So that will be good. That will just start, you know, spare That's excellent. Stuff. Yeah, that will really, um, you know, it's going to take a while. You know, it's a little step at a time, but I think that's major, you know, to start something in the downtown, starting, um, you know, rehabbing the downtown, just the facades. And I've gone out with her. Uh, to meet with the people, and they're very excited about it. About you know, we have a, an architect, and um, she's fabulous, and she's been working with us and working with the uh, owners of the buildings. Um, and the designs are beautiful. Well, you know, Noreen and Joe, that really illustrates kind of how things are incremental, mm -hmm. because there's, you know, it's almost like an iceberg. There's so much work that has to. Uh, happen before people see it on the street. It's um, people having the idea, then going and get securing some money from some grant sources to do it, getting an architect, talking to property owners, mm -hmm. getting them interested, then design, doing this design, and now it's doing the financing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to do construction, and then people get to see it. So there's like you know eight or nine steps before p anyone will even see a hammer moving. And as you know, those programs, you know, it's a few years on the ground. You know, lots of paperwork and um, lots of changes as you as you go on. You know. Um, you do one building and then it's like the domino effect. You know, someone, you know, paints their home and then all of a sudden you start looking at your own and say, gee, maybe I could do that. <laughs> so it's a slow process. Um, what I would love to do, um, you know, besides the sign and facade, you know, this is for the future. Um, I'd like to see that we could close that end of Wyman Street. I think that would be nice if um, everything could be developed on that street and it would just be for pedestrians and then we could create, you know, parking in other areas. And I like that idea uh, that you mentioned um, on Freeman and Washington Street where the, um, you know, um, municipal parking lot is there too. And we could take some of those spaces and, and push that green space back and we had talked earlier about this of you know, adding some benches or things like that, some amenities there. And I think that um, just the little things, and it does take a long time, you know, it, you know, and people start to see things. And I think once those building facades start to happen, then people will see that there's a lot of positive things happening you know, in the lot, downtown. There is a lot of positives. And, and the, these little things help, um, help fill existing vacancies because when people see something happening, then uh, prospective, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and businesses say, oh, I'll, uh, you know, 
I might spend some time there. Mm -hmm. You know, they're making investments. Things are improving. That's a good opportunity. Uh, and, and these small projects are important while others are working on the big pro uh, mm -hmm. on perhaps larger projects because you need to set, have some visible changes and you know the projects like the state theater and the depot are longer term projects and they're going to need to need a lot of work behind the scenes mm -hmm. and need to keep moving forward um, but it, it isn't one single bullet, it is the combination of all these and the projects help reinforce and support each other. I, I would like to step back for a minute, you had said something earlier. I'm wondering uh, for purposes of cable, could you explain what the public-private partnership is? Oh sure. Um, downtowns and business districts, that's, um, you know, that's the private market, you know, you have small businesses, you have regional businesses, those are all private sector owned. You also sometimes have nonprofits uh, who um, sometimes it's churches, sometimes it's community service organizations that also have offices in um, presence in town centers. Um, and you want to have the nonprofit sector as well as the private sector. But the, you also need the public sector. Um, and sometimes it requires zoning changes, sometimes the, the public sector is responsible for the sidewalk and the streets and, some, you know, and sometimes parkland spa parking spaces, off street parking, um, sometimes also you know, the street trees and you know, amenities, that's, the air, that's often the public sector domain. Uh, so, in order for the private sector to thrive, they need public investments, but the public sector needs the private sector to thrive so it can get real estate tax money. Mm -hmm. So you need that combination and it, it's kind of, um, you're kind of joined at the hip even though you're separate and you know, you need the private sector, you need the public sector and you need to work together and be talking with each other. and be responsive to some of the issues of the business community or private property owners or prospective developers. Uh, and also, uh, the public sector needs the private sector to do what it does best. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, operate businesses that serve customers and provide needed services and goods and services. I think well, that segues, Joe, into zoning. Well, before we get to zoning, yeah. I wanted to um, ask Kathleen a question about um, in terms of the public-private partnership, the public component of that has gotten a lot of discussion of late about eminent domain with respect to um, developing and, and rejuvenating downtowns. And in your experience, um, Kathleen, has this been an effective tool uh, in most of the downtowns that you've seen turn around, or, or is it more of a... Um, um, private sector uh, leading the charge. Have you seen that uh, particular public uh, uh, process being really effective in, in turning a downtown around? I, I think you definitely need public leadership as well as private leader, leadership. I don't think it's a one or the other. Um, I am hesitant to use the tool eminent domain uh, I think that often strikes terror in private property owners' heart. You know, sometimes eminent domain is used to clear, um, you know, when you need rights away in terms of sidewalks or parking or streets. Um, and that may be an appropriate use of, of eminent domain. Um, really in the last decade, uh, a lot of communities have backed off the whole notion of eminent domain regarding economic development and some federal programs will not allow eminent domain for economic development if there could be a funder in it. Um, the other part is you always have to have a public purpose and uh, a public municipal purpose and uh, you know parks are, uh, are a public uh, public municipal service, um, 
you know, streets, transportation, streets and sidewalks, parking as a public purpose. Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Um, infrastructure that's publicly owned is a public purpose. Um, mm -hmm. So that um, issues regarding economic development, that's where I, you have sometimes a redevelopment authority and a redevelopment authority when it has an approved uh, urban renewal plan that's been approved by the state uh, can use eminent domain to further and implement that urban renewal plan. And Stoughton does have a redevelopment authority, um, but I don't think it has a, an approved uh, urban renewal plan for the downtown at this time. It's not a, It's not uh, gone through the formal process uh, under the state statute for that. Right. It's a pretty rigorous process, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, my recollection is that um, it has. There's quite a bit of town action that's required, and then. Um, DHCD is involved, and then I believe the Massachusetts legislature under a home rule petition has to rule on it as well. Um, an urban renewal plan is can be established uh, subject to Chapter 121B of the Massachusetts General Laws, and it needs to be approved by the town. Um, so the Board of Selectmen would have to approve any uh, urban renewal plan. Uh, and it also requires a high degree of public participation and engagement uh, in the development of an urban renewal plan. There is specific requirements that are, um, are in the Code of Massachusetts regulations that an urban renewal plan must be included and addressed. Uh, the redevelopment authority would have to hold public hearings as well as the town um, and prior to approval uh, and it has to have a written, a written um, detailed uh, renewal plan. It is also then submitted to the state and the Department of Housing and Community Development must approve it. It also has to have uh, environmental notice. Uh, and go through the MEPA process. Um, MEPA is the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act uh, p prior to, um, to final approval by DHCD, uh, which is Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, the legislature does not typically get involved, but sometimes uh, communities utilize the legislature to help um, have a home rule petition on funding. So it mm. sounds to me like that process isn't a particularly quick one. No. It, it, it can be helpful, um, and I'm not saying someone shouldn't pursue it, uh, but I think there's, you know, I think there's other things you could and should be doing to help move everything forward. Mm -hmm. um, before we go into Ms. O'Toole's point about the zoning, um, I wanted to talk about, you mentioned about uh, transit-oriented development. And um, I'm sure that the uh, viewers have been wondering why all these charts and pictures are, are all around <laughs> us here. And so I guess I'd like to have Ms. O'Toole talk about uh, one of the, uh, some of the transit-oriented projects in the square uh, that, have, that have been approved by the planning board and uh, are shovel-ready and just about ready to break ground in some cases. Ms. Otto, would you uh, sure. go through those for the, our listeners? Uh, for the public, um, the picture that you see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, which says Monk Street, it's actually Monk Street and Washington Street, and the building is actually called the Drake. Um, it is 15 units, and it's been up for a couple of years now, very successful and um, nice design and that's adding to our housing stock, and it's walkable to the um, Stoughton Town Center Plaza there and to our downtown. And if you uh, look over to the right, our next building, which will be built within the next two years, is the Malcolm and Parsons Building, and everybody knows that area on the corner of Washington and Freeman Street. Um, that particular project is 14 units, and that, um, if I'm looking at the screen now, that would be the building on your right. And that's also a, a very contemporary design. 
uh, with, with lots of landscaping, and that will have planters um, in the sidewalk area. And um, one of the planning board's requirements is that it would be all lit up uh, within the planters so that you would always see um, a clear light there and in an attractive um, curbside effect this will have with all of the landscaping. And uh, that would be 14 units. And if you look down to your far left, uh, this residential use is, and I know everybody knows Fraggers Market, and someone here at Cable mentioned that they had really good hamburgers at one time, um, a long time ago, and some of you folks might remember that. Uh, Fraggers Market uh, is on, for the folks who may not know, 105 Porter Street, and that will be 30 residential units and also a uh, walking distance uh, to our downtown. And that one, that building has just been, um, just been demoed uh, within the last couple of weeks. And to your right, I don't have a plan on this one. This one's a little older. Um, this is Morton Square. Uh, if you're traveling uh, down Wyman Street and you go by the depot and you cross the tracks, and if you look in front of you, you'll see an interesting looking parcel that is triangular in shape. And that particular parcel, um, that would be 28 units. So we're really um, building on our housing. And there's one other project too that is, um, as there's a second project on Monk Street and um, it done by the uh, same developer uh, who did the uh, Monk and Washington Street, and that's also a residential uh, project. And they have been very successful, you know, in the downtown, the ones that are built. And right now, if you add up all of the existing and the projects that we will have, we will have approximately 102 housing units in the downtown. And we have a need for um, rental space because I know in the Drake, which is the 15 units on Monk Street, that was totally filled in four weeks, um, all of those units. And um, I, the developer on that is uh, Anthony Rasudo, and I had asked him about that, and he actually hires a company and they vet, they vet the uh, people who want to move into the building. And uh, if you have a pet, pets are allowed, you bring, <coughs> you bring your pet with you. And, um, so the broker uh, can establish a little relationship with the pet to make sure the pet is apartment friendly. And it's been very successful. And all of these in housing, you know, I was going through the uh, development plans here for the downtown. And, you know, one of the goals is to develop housing in and around the downtown uh, because we're in walking distance to the train in walking distance, you know, to have something to eat and other services. And what we'd like to do um, is really develop that downtown. Uh, we have vacancies, you know, we need more uses that people would come, almost like a destination that they'd come to our downtown. But a little at a time through the community development program with the sign and survive facade program, I think once those programs come into effect and people see, you know, I think we have uses in downtown people don't know we have. Yeah. because they, we have hidden uses um, in the downtown. Like for instance, we have on Wyman Street someone who does wedding planning, planning. And I'm sure a lot of people don't know that because there's really no facade, there's no sign, and you don't know what building it's in. I mean, you know the stuff that we always see, like, you know, the, the Stoughton Bakery, you know, we know those, but there are other things hidden within it and even, um, in the, um, for, for you folks been been around a while, the Pachico building, which is that building that is um, facing Washington Street, but actually behind the municipal parking. Um, there are a lot of businesses in that building, um, almost like a business incubator that um, if you didn't go, there, there's not signs outside, but if there could be something developed that maybe we could, you know, help them in the public partnership, you know, in through the sign and facade, facade program, you know, put what all the uses are in there. You know, there's probably 10 businesses in there we don't even know about. 
Uh-huh. You know, they might be small, but they're businesses that we, you may need, but you don't know that it's there. So sometimes I think, even with the municipal parking, we do have a sign there. We've never had a sign there. So people really didn't know it was municipal parking. Uh, so I think they were, had a signage problem, and we're trying to fix that. But we want people to know what we have down there, so you can stop parking that lot and go in that building or whatever you might want to do when you're in the downtown. And I did want to ask our consultant, Kathy, I wanted to ask her about um, bid districts in, you know, would that make sense for our downtown where it's not that large? Well, some, uh, well, let's talk about what a bid district is. Right, right. A uh, bid district, uh, bid stands for business improvement district. And it's a way uh, of generating some additional fees. Uh, and it requires the, um, uh, uh, to, to develop a plan of action uh, that involves the property owner, all the, uh, the property owners and the businesses. So you have to have at least, uh, 51% of, uh, of the assessed value of the property owners represented and 60% of the property owners numerically represented. Mm -hmm. um, a bid district can be very effective. Uh, many start with issues like safety and cleanliness to really kind of making sure uh, an area is spiffed up. And one of the reasons why downtowns think about bid districts is when you think about shopping centers, they have a single management entity that helps the promotions and marketing of the shopping district. They do the snow removal. They make sure that inside the sidewalk, the walking areas are clean, that there are seasonal planting changes, there's seasonal decorations. They might have the security force. And businesses in a shopping center then pay a common area fee, a common maintenance fee, or what's called a CAM fee. So in a downtown, you really have a series of independent property owners and independent businesses. And we all like our independence, but we've also learned, um, you know, fire departments used to be all independent, but they became municipal because we learned that working together we are sometimes more effective and that we need that um, collaborative approach for protection and success so really a bid district really is a, a strategy to help everyone flourish um, but it would then having an action plan of what the property owners wanted and businesses want to be done and it might be focusing on safety and cleanliness sometimes it's focused on seasonal decorations and it assesses a fee um, to go towards that. It can help towards management and some of the marketing and promotion, but it's really developed uh, in conjunction with the property owners and it's property owner, business owner driven. And it could be a very good tool for downtown Stone. You've got, you've got a recognizable, cohesive district um, and as you, uh, pursue revitalization, having more resources, I think could make it um, uh, help you be more successful. And how does that happen? Does the uh, district have a manager? The districts can uh, uh, hire a manager. Sometimes municipalities provide, um, you know, the economic development coordinator or the town planner um, provides some staffing services, particularly when it's first getting started. Mm -hmm. Uh, but having uh, a part-time person. Um, bids are not, um, can provide supplemental services to the municipality. Um, the municipality is still required to main, provide the basic services mm -hmm. to the district. So it's not a funding source to replace mm -hmm. town resources, it's, it's to supplement. It's saying, okay, well, here's the baseline services, and we really need more, so we'll use, you know, we'll self-assess. So what you're saying is um, they would have their own goals, and they would uh, do it privately. They would maybe um, pay a manager to get someone to clean or to get someone to right. water plants or whatever it might be. 
Correct. That's how it usually works. And it is an example of a public-private partnership because it's typically the fee is uh, levied, um, the fee is um, attached to your real estate tax bill, so the town is often involved in the fee collection, mm -hmm. and then it's uh, and the board of selectmen ha uh, has to have a public hearing and approve the um, petition to form a bid and the the action plan uh, on the three year action plan. It can be dissolved at any time, but it's got it on the initial creation has to be approved, and every three years the plan has to be updated and approved. So if you had an economic development committee, they could work with, with people within that district. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so. And that can, you know, again, that's an example of the public sector and the private sector working together. Each brings its own source of expertise mm -hmm. and knowledge. I'd like to go back to the, um, the protocols for development. And we were t we've been talking about housing before we talked about the bid mm -hmm. district. Um, and so I'd like to get Kathleen's comment on the role of the housing that's going on in Stoughton right now in terms of this, the stages of economic redevelopment of the square. Well, housing really leads commercial. I mean, uh, commercial does not start, commercial uses follow where people are. And that's why doing special events and bringing people downtown that helps build your commercial market because businesses go where people are. So also on the housing front, having more housing, particularly when you have a walkable town center and you have a train is a real benefit. So really uh, adding more housing units uh, is a real plus. Uh, you are a short train ride uh, to downtown Boston. So, uh, and yet you have the benefits of being a small town, um, which is attractive to people. So having that um, housing development, I would say is essential element of downtown revitalization. And um, you should be applauded for it because a lot of people, it's, um, you've really been incrementally working on that mm -hmm. and have made, you know, approved zoning that made it a little easier for our housing development in the downtown. So I think that's all very positive and um, you should be commended for having as, uh, you know, uh, having as many uh, housing starts that you have in the downtown. Thank you, and I know Ms. O'Toole wanted to talk about it, and it's a good segue with your comment about zoning. And we've, we've, the planning board has taken an incremental approach to trying to see what works, what the projects, when they come before the planning board, uh, what kinds of impediments that the developers are saying, uh, what they're asking for in terms of relief from zoning and, and um, going back to the framework of the zoning bylaw and trying to make some fine tuning to that. And I guess at this point, uh, I'll let Ms. O'Toole comment on the, the zoning <coughs> initiatives that the planning board has uh, done, f tried to uh, accomplish in the last couple of years in this area. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think with the planning board, uh, we've looked at the downtown. The common bylaw was initiated uh, by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, which is a regional planning agency out of Boston. And um, they put that bylaw together for the town in 2006. And I think that, um, you know, as Kathy alluded to, we have to change with the times. And zoning has to change with the times. Uh, what we've tried to do over the last couple of years is, besides doing the recodification uh, a few years ago, uh, which we did in 2015, of the whole bylaw, now we're working off from that recodification uh, to update um, just definitions in general that uh, we didn't have to deal with, whether it be, um, you know, working with the Board of Health on vape shops, uh, working on the marijuana bylaw, you know, things that, um, you know, laws are passed, initiatives are passed, so, and everything affects zoning and affects our land use, and, you know, what do you want in the downtown? So we're looking at that model all the time. And what the planning board has tried to do is, we've really stressed that uh, public-private partnership. And, you know, some of our um, projects uh, were hindered because some of our zoning 
um, down there was a little uh, stringent. So we've tried to go to town meeting to uh, address um, an open space, um, rear yard setbacks in buildings. I mean, these buildings are attached. And um, it's pretty difficult uh, for the developers to meet these types of um, zoning, you know, dimensions. And I think that it's taken, you know, some of the projects a little longer than um, it would have uh, maybe in other towns. Um, I mean, we have discretionary power. We are a special permit granting authority in the downtown, but not on not on every single item, just in certain areas. So it stymied us. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that Malcolm and Parsons project would probably suffered the most uh, because um, it just didn't fit. And I think, you know, people think, well, why should we suit something for one developer? Well, you know, we're not suiting it for one developer. It's for the people that are coming in. We're seeing as a planning board through planning that it's, it's not working. And uh, we want it to work because it is a partnership. You know, we bring people into the downtown. People live in these units and they will spend their money in our downtown and that will revitalize us. So that, that was our, that's always been our intention when we go to town meeting, uh, not to have one person or one building to help the entire um, Stoughton Center mixed use overlay district um, and, and work with the developers. And uh, you know, that, that, that's the personality of the planning board that um, we, we really strive to work with the developers and get the best development that we can. So uh, we continue to uh, work on that downtown and we will always continue to uh, work on the zoning because that's one of our jobs. And that's, that's a very important and integral job in order for this town to be successful. Um, but land use has to make sense um, and land use has to fit, you know, 2018, um, not 2006. So we need to move forward and, um, you know, be a little more open to uh, what's going on uh, in society in general. And, and, you know, once this, as, you know, our consultant spoke about earlier, you know, once we start redeveloping and the buildings start looking nicer and then we build this 14 unit building and, you know, everything will pop there and then, you know, people, it will, as I said earlier, be the domino effect. But it takes a long time and I know people are impatient and, <clears throat> and they talk about the hole in the ground there. Well, that fire was nine years ago and um, things don't happen overnight. Uh, that building actually just passed papers a year ago. Um, the original owner owned it, you know, for the last seven and a half years and uh, just passed papers with the person that's developing it. So um, it's not that it was delayed per se, it wasn't sold to be developed. And now it is. And uh, the plan was just submitted November 13th um, because originally the building was 21 units and the plan is revised down to 14 units uh, in order to uh, meet the parking that is in the bylaw. And I think that it will be a success and I think people will be really pleased when they see it. And I think once that's developed, I think you'll see other things happening in the downtown. And that's why we're you know, pushing to continue with the zoning uh, in, in working with all sorts, <coughs> excuse me, all sorts of developers out there uh, on our zoning bylaws. Um, since we have the um, Kathleen with us today, um, speaking of getting specific with the zoning, you mentioned the categories, but um, Kathleen's been involved with a lot of uh, downtown revitalization projects throughout the state. And so I, I'd like to get your reaction. One of the provisions that we've uh, worked on uh, and seen as a major impediment is this 10% requirement, and it's a site requirement not necessarily a block requirement, but that each project that comes have a 10% space allocated to open. And ours is a bit unique. Unlike the city of Boston, which can use an atrium, ours has to be open to the sky. 
So you can't even use a, 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 an atrium in the middle of a building to qualify for the open space. So I, I would like you to comment on how many times you see this kind of requirement out there in the downtowns that you've worked on. Well, I think there's a couple of things to think about in terms of open space requirements. One, your downtown tends to be your densest area of a community. So, and that's because, uh, and that density helps make it vital and vibrant. So you want, that's a good thing. The plan that was developed, which had, we had several large scale community forums. We also really built on the vision that had a lot of different working groups for the overall master plan. And we have a image of it behind uh, Noreen and Joe right here. And this was developed uh, and refined by the working committee of the master plan that represented, a, you know, there was people from the Conservation Commission, there was people from the Planning Board, the Board of Appeals, the Board of Selectmen, uh, a lot of different constituency groups. And there was a real interest in greening downtown was one of the goals. And some of that involved street trees, some of it involved putting trees in parking areas or landscaping, but it also, you know, there were the specific things um, that the committee uh, endorsed was greening on Washington by Freeman Street in front of the municipal parking lot, not the whole parking area, just a little mm -hmm. bit, and, you know, restriping so we could retain almost the same number of parking spaces. Uh, but also the, the plan called for uh, a great lawn um, and to incorporate that really behind, between Wyman and um, Porter Street. So that's the longer term vision. So the, look, the plan calls for an aggregated, looking at open space on an aggregated basis. Not on a parcel basis. Not on a parcel yeah. basis. And we've been finding that this cuts into the, uh, the uh, cash flow that comes out of projects and, and have received comments that it's, it, it doesn't uh, make the projects attractive for bank financing because the banks look at the ability to um, be able to um, uh, take over a project and get the flow of rents from that. Well, one of the things in downtowns is that open space and parking um, are often um, looked at in aggregate as a whole, not a parcel by parcel. Mm -hmm. Um, because sense. you want it to be walkable uh, and you know some areas uh, have parking districts and they have requirements for uh, either incorporating um, um, you know some trees and landscaping as well as um, some greener versions of stormwater management within the parking lots um, but it's it's a aggregate area of the entire downtown. And similar with open space, you know, ha, um, you know one of the reasons, open space is nice as an amenity, but also in this era of uh, climate change and extreme, more weather extremes, it's helpful to have open space as part of um, really kind of being more resilient um, from a climate perspective. So the plan does call for open space, but it was look, it looked at it as total. And yes. that's what the master plan committee mm. and the vision that people wanted was agreed upon. And that was debated. Thank you. I'm getting the high sign from our producer that now is the time that the uh, commercial, uh, our sponsors have an opportunity to uh, uh, present to the viewers. So I. Hi, it's Gary Lapierre, and the crew wants to thank mm, 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 Maxie's Delicatessen. That's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments. 1-800-ACS-6662, or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry, 
in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher. That's at 781-341-0611 or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels. Just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension 2. Stoughton Penny Saver. Our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m. Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m., it's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street on the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 617-536-2460. 24-hour helplines for Samaritans. And the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-HOPE. 4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800 252 teen. That's 252 8336. Or find them online at SamaritansHope.org. Again, I'd like to um, thank the panel, Noreen O'Toole, our town planner, that can be reached at 10 Pearl Street, second floor, Stoughton Town Hall. Uh, her website is notool at stoughton.ma.gov, 781-232-3201, excuse me, 9201. Um, Kathleen McCabe, uh, principal of McCabe Enterprises, our guest, special guest today. Uh, you can reach Kathleen at uh, McCabe at plando.com, 617-469-9444. I'd like to, um, again, uh, thank the production staff here at, uh, at um, SMAC, Michael Hammond, Jeff Pickett, C.J. Mullen, David Young, Leo McGowan, our camera extraordinaire operator, Roy Cohen, our producer, last but not least. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in.